You know, I realize as I'm posting this video that we're already in October, and, um, uh, I mean, the scariest thing that's happening to me is I'm starting a new job next week. Still, there's plenty of spooky stuff we'll cover in today's video. So I previously created a poll to see where you guys thought our next mythological journey would take us, and I'm pleased to announce that you were all correct. The answer was all of the above. Allow me to elaborate. Today, we're diving into the mystical world of Georgian folklore. Now, when we Americans hear the name Georgia, we usually think of the state north of Florida, or Atlanta, or maybe even The Walking Dead. But in case you didn't know, Georgia is, in fact, a whole country over on the Eurasian continent that lies off the eastern coast of the Black Sea between the Caucasus Mountains. That's where the term Caucasian comes from, by the way. Since we previously covered both Celtic and Slavic mythology, I figured we should shift our focus further eastward to the crossroads of Europe and Asia, with a rich tapestry of myths and legends just begging to be explored by this channel. Many of these mythical creatures come from Kartvelian times, before modern Georgia came to be. But as new nations and kingdoms rose and fell, and with the introduction of Christianity in medieval times, many of these myths evolved to suit the shift in culture. In fact, Georgia's unique position puts it in close contact with diverse faiths and cultures. Even today, it contains a wide array of Christians, Muslims, and even Zoroastrians. Now, I don't personally know any Georgians, so if there are any Georgians watching this, please correct me in the comments if I make any mistakes in pronunciation, and feel free to fact check me if I miss something. Anyways, it's time to grab a snack and sit back as we cover eight mythical creatures from Georgian mythology, starting with... Number 1. Paskunji. Legend has it that this phoenix-like creature dwelt in the underworld and fought draconic serpents there. Much like the Egyptian phoenix, which was commonly associated with healing and rebirth, the Paskunji could be summoned by burning one of its feathers, where it would then heal wounds and cure diseases, or even give the summoner a ride to somewhere else. In other versions, the Paskunji was more animalistic, preying primarily on livestock, but was capable of taking on a human form to lure unsuspecting travelers to their doom. With a fiery avian appearance, I can't help but draw parallels to the Egyptian Bennu, the sacred bird of the sun god Ra, or even Wajit, a winged serpent who served as a protective deity to pharaohs and monarchy. Wajit also commonly took the form of an Egyptian vulture, which some historians believe to have been the direct inspiration for the Paskunji. For more info on Egyptian mythology, check out this video. I guess vultures are helpful in their own right, though I can't say I'd feel 100% safe if I saw a giant flaming vulture flying towards me after a cry for help. Number 2. Kudiani. The Kudiani are witches and sorceresses often seen in the form of ugly hunched back hags with large teeth and tails. In fact, Kudi actually means tail, and just like any stereotypical witch, Kudiani are also shape changers who take on diverse forms, though their favorite was a beautiful woman to lure and bewitch locals. Their coven, I'll call it was based in the Caucasus Mountains, though on a particularly bald mountain was where they would often meet with their leader Rokapi and hold their own festivals similar to the Western Walpurgis Night. Walpurgis Night is a celebration held in honor of Saint Walpurga, who was believed to have the power to repel witches. This event is also commonly known as Witches Night, where locals light fires to safeguard against witches and other evil spirits. This is mostly celebrated in Western Europe, and in modern times, locals will dress up as witches and set off fireworks while dancing and playing loud music to drive off the evil spirits. It's celebrated on the night of April 30th and the day of May 1st. Number 3. Deva. Deva are interesting, especially the history behind them. They're supernatural beings, who are essentially demons, originally based in Zoroastrianism, but in the oldest Zoroastrian texts, they're simply described as gods that are to be rejected. This somewhat vague description has led to different interpretations as to what exactly Deva are supposed to be. In Old Persia, they were gods of chaos and disorder, and over time merged with Islamic beliefs as Deev. And it's also speculated that Deva as malevolent forces were inspired by Scythian gods. 
But what really makes the Zoroastrian phrase, gods that are to be rejected, so hard to interpret, is that the word deva derives from the old Iranian deva, which still means a god, but in a positive connotation, rather than referring to something demonic. So although the more common depiction sees deva as dark spirits, the derivation of the word alludes to gods who were rejected, but not necessarily demons. Of course, despite the academic debate on the name, the deva in scripture are often described as hostile entities or gods that are not accepted by the true faith, and those who worship these other gods are met with religious disapproval and seen as deviating from accepted practices. Kind of lengthy, I know, but the TLDR is deva are demons, but the name also refers to false gods who are not to be accepted by those faithful to the true religion. At least that's all I gathered from this. If you have more information on this topic, feel free to share in the comments. Number four, Kersha, the legendary companion to the hero Amirani, who I'll cover shortly. Kersha is a dog. He's featured in a number of stories, and his name simply means Black Ear, which considering his reputation is understandably a common name for Georgian doggies. Kersha was no ordinary dog, however, as he possessed the ability to leap across great fields, track prey to the ends of the earth, and his bark was a thunderous boom. He's also described as having huge paws and golden lips, and in some versions, Kersha was believed to have been born by a raven or an eagle, and had a pair of wings as a result of his avian origins. Aside from his master Amirani, the national hero of Georgian myth, Kersha has also been seen as the companion to a mortal hunter named Betkil. After betraying his lover, the mountain goddess Dali, by sleeping with a mortal woman, Betkil is trapped atop a mountain with Kersha as his faithful hound. In one version of the tale, Kersha leaves to find help and comes back with villagers who try to help Betkil down the mountain, but despite their best efforts, Betkil falls to his death as the enraged Dali intervenes. In another, more depressing version of the tale, Kersha urges his master to kill and eat him to survive his isolation, to which a starving Betkil eventually gives in and kills his companion, but after preparing a fire to cook and eat him, he simply can't bring himself to consume his loyal friend. Dogs, man. Seems they're universally man's best friend. Number 5. All. Going back to demons now, all are based in Armenian and Iranian folklore, but according to my research, they have a presence in Georgia as well. All are rather horrid creatures with pale skin, fiery eyes, jagged fangs accompanied by boar-like tusks, saggy breasts, sometimes with one tossed over the shoulder, and metallic claws. They can be male or female, with females often disguising themselves as captivating beauties, but overall they resemble evil old crones, and like to steal the organs of women, usually the heart, lung, or liver. They also serve as a warning for children who find themselves lost in the woods or playing too close to some old ruins. Across many cultures in the Caucasus, they're also known to destroy embryos in the womb, resulting in a miscarriage, or just stealing newborns and replacing them with imps. If a woman is attacked by an owl and has an organ stolen, the only way to get it back is to stop the ugly hag from reaching water. Otherwise, the victim is good as gone. The best way to repel an all is the same as any other demon. Iron, garlic, charms, or prayers, and when all else fails, some good old magic. These remind me a lot of Kikimura, or Liho, from Slavic mythology for some reason. Both an explanation for familial tragedy, and a cautionary tale to deter children from wandering off where they shouldn't. Before we continue, I'd just like to say a thank you to those of you who made it this far, as your continued interest is much appreciated. It's inevitable that most of you watching are just passing through, but if you've learned anything new, I invite you to hit that like button so I know you're enjoying this type of content, and subscribe for more videos like this. Anyways, back to our regularly scheduled program. Number 6. Dragons in contrast to the western winged lizards who wreaked havoc on kingdoms and were seen as powerful adversaries, Georgian dragons more closely resembled dragons of the east. They were noble and wise, more serpentine in appearance, and helped guide travelers to nearby bodies of water. Reminds me a lot of gold dragons from D&D. The word for dragon in Georgian is Gvelashapi, 
which is a composite of the words for whale and serpent. And though they lived in high mountains, the Gvelishapi were born in the sea. With the spread of Christianity, tales of dragons withholding water from travelers and committing acts of violence became more common, and they began to change to be more like the western dragons. Just another example of how cultures change over time and develop new stories that sometimes contradict previously held beliefs. It's still fascinating how a country at the crossroads of so many different cultures adapted to new ideologies in their own way. Number 7. Devi Devi were multi-headed ogres who lived in the underworld or in far remote mountains, similar to giants like the Greek Cyclops or Jotun from Norse mythology. Devi were violent creatures that hoarded treasures and captives in their secret lairs. Though Devi had a unique family dynamic, where they commonly lived together as brothers, with nine being the average size for a Devi household. They're described as having thick hair and horns on their heads, that when severed, can regenerate, similar to a uh, Hydra. To defeat them, heroes would rely on tricks of deceit to outsmart them and escape with their treasure or free captives, or to slay them. They remind me of Ettons, or those ogre mages in World of Warcraft. I imagine a family of nine three-headed ogres makes for quite the noisy house, but at least they're never truly alone. Number 8. Amirani. Last but certainly not least is the demigod Amirani. He's the son of the aforementioned mountain goddess Dali and a mortal hunter. He performed several monumental feats, such as slaying devis, challenging the gods, and teaching humans metallurgy. As punishment for his defiance against the gods, Amirani is chained to a rock face in the Caucasus and imprisoned there with his faithful hound Kursha, who we covered previously. In some versions, an eagle attacks Amirani and removes his liver daily, as he quickly recovers his liver every night. His companion Kursha tries his best to free his master by licking his chains, but despite his efforts, every year on the same Thursday, or in some sales specifically the day before Christmas, the chain is repaired, forcing Kursha to start all over again in a futile attempt to free his beloved master. In Georgian literature, Amirani is depicted as a symbolic hero of the Georgian people, a representation of their struggles and ordeals. His uncanny resemblance of the Greek Prometheus is perhaps attributed to Greek colonists and travelers over the country's lifetime. As Christianity began to take hold in old Georgia, the tale of Amirani evolved to have him defy the Christian god, resulting in the same imprisonment. Well, there you have it. That was Eight Creatures from Georgian Mythology. Feel free to leave a comment about your favorite entry from this list, and if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more futile facts. I'll see you all... Actually, before we go, I have some thoughts I want to share with you all. Time is a valuable resource, and one I constantly struggle to maintain when it comes to keeping up with this channel. Between work, family, and my own personal time, I struggle to find a balance between them all. I'm always giving my content a lot of thought, and as we approach the end of my first year on this platform, I can't help but feel a desire to keep seeking better ways to connect with y'all. It's every YouTuber's dream to have an audience that's interested in not only in what's being presented, but in the presenter themselves. What I'm wondering is, aside from the educational content where I talk about medieval history and different mythologies, there's other topics I share a passion for, like world building or Dungeons and Dragons, and it's no secret I trickle these concepts into my current videos wherever I find the chance. So for those of you who made it this far, all I ask is do you think the implementation of new videos where I talk about D&D or world building with an emphasis on historical inspiration would be interesting? And if so, what are some ideas you have for videos you'd like to see in that particular subgenre? Thanks again for watching if you made it this far. It really means a lot. This is Feudal Facts, signing off.